Welcome to Library Seminars, a platform for the presentation of research and ideas in support of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's mission. I'm Lisa Clark, your NOAA Central Library host. Today's webinar, an overview of hurricane history, hazards, and forecasting, will be presented by John Cangiolosi, Senior Hurricane Specialist at the National Weather Service's National Hurricane Center in Miami, Florida. John has worked at the Hurricane Center since 2005 and is an expert in tropical cyclone forecasting, marine forecasting, and tropical cyclone applied research. The position involves the issuance of track, intensity, and wind radii forecasts, as well as associated watches and warnings for tropical cyclones in the Atlantic and Eastern North Pacific Oceans. John is also an instructor for several courses designed for emergency managers, meteorologists, and students. He authors and co-authors a number of the official National Hurricane Center Tropical Cyclone Reports, the annual National Hurricane Center Verification Report, and several applied research studies on hurricanes. John presents at and participates in several meteorological meetings, and he specializes in education and outreach to promote hurricane awareness and preparedness. We are honored to have him here today at this library seminar. Before I turn the mic over, I have a few housekeeping items to review. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel by later this afternoon. We will be accepting questions, the questions throughout the webinar, uh, which John will address at the end of his presentation. So I encourage you to type your questions as you think of them into the question chat box located in your control panel. And while you're in the control panel, please feel free to download today's slides located under handouts. So with that last detail, I pass the mic to you, John. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, depending upon where you are. I'm delighted to be with you. And hopefully you're excited to learn a little bit about hurricanes, some recent history, their hazards, and some elements of forecasting from the Hurricane Center. And looking forward to your questions. So please don't be shy. Really, that's the most exciting part for me. All right, now before we get into this material, I want you to do something for me. I want you to, let me see if I get this to advance. There we go. I want you to close your eyes for a second and I want you to think of a hurricane. Now I know there's probably some meteorologists on the line, so I don't want you to visualize a satellite image of a hurricane. I want you to feel a hurricane. Are you doing it? All right, what comes to mind? Now what most people tend to think of is the wind. But in reality, I really want you to think of the water because that is what unfortunately kills people when it comes to hurricanes. Take a look at the results of this study. This is a 50 year period from 1963 to 2012. And we tabulated how people unfortunately lost their lives in tropical cyclones in the United States. And what was found was that nearly half, 50% of how people, 49% of how people died unfortunately in hurricanes drowned in the storm surge flooding. Another 27% drowned in the rain-induced floods. And in fact, if you add up all of the water-related hazards, that accounts for 90%. Yeah, 90% of how people unfortunately lose their lives in hurricanes drown. So even though most of us tend to think of the wind and kind of hear that howling wind, it's the water that's the biggest problem. So please hold on to that fact. And I want you to remember that when you hear of hurricanes, Unfortunately, they're coming in 2021. All right, so before we talk about 2020 and really what's coming and what we do at the Hurricane Center, I wanna take a little bit of time reviewing some recent history because there have been some horrendous hurricane seasons of late. Let's start during the 2017 hurricane season. That was an unprecedented year for the United States when it comes to hurricanes. There were three category four landfalls, never happened before the costliest year on record for the US, which resulted in more than $250 billion in damage from tropical cyclones alone. Of the big ones, Maria was the strongest hurricane to impact Puerto Rico since 1928, and Harvey was the deadliest Texas hurricane in about a century. Part of the reason Harvey was so bad, or really the majority of the reason Harvey was so bad, was the tremendous rains that fell and there were a couple of spots in far southeastern Texas that reported about five feet of rain during Harvey. In 2018, the season was pretty bad, but certainly a little bit of a respite compared to 2017, yet we still had these two very impactful hurricanes affect the US. 
Hurricane Florence caused about $24 billion in damage, primarily across the Carolinas, where there was an area in southeastern North Carolina that saw 35 inches of rain. That's a state record that was previously set by Hurricane Floyd in 1999. And then Michael, the picture you see there on the right, caused about $25 billion in damage across the Florida panhandle and then inland across Alabama and Georgia. So Michael, believe it or not, was only the fourth Category 5 hurricane to ever impact the United States. We're talking as far back as we know to the 1850s. The previous one before Michael, which was in 2018, was Andrew in 1992 that made landfall about 20 minutes south of where I'm sitting right now. All right, let's move up to 2019. Now, in 2019, the U.S. did not see an impact from a major hurricane. There were hurricanes and tropical storms that hit the U.S., but no majors. So we'll actually consider that a success. But it was not a success for the Bahamas, as Hurricane Dorian just really caused catastrophic damage. Take a look at the pictures you see here. Dorian was the most intense hurricane to ever make landfall in the Bahamas. Try to process that stat for a minute. The most intense hurricane ever in the Bahamas? That's insane. And the reason why Dorian was so bad is it struck Abaco Island on the 1st of September and then became basically stationary near Grand Bahama Island, which is in the Northwestern Bahamas, for more than a day. And it caused catastrophic wind and storm surge damage. And I think those pictures tell you everything you need to know. Now, you'll, you'll learn later that we work closely with meteorological services really from around the world, or at least around the world in the Hurricane Center's area of responsibility, the Bahamas being one of them. And the last we spoke to them, the damage and the death storm is largely unknown. And now let's get you up to speed with 2020, a truly record-breaking Atlantic season all during the pandemic. So this spelled just a tremendous challenge for the Hurricane Center and a lot of the local forecast offices that were impacted. 30 named storms occurred during 2020, 13 hurricanes, six of them major hurricanes, that's category threes or higher. The ACE, it's called the Cumulated Cyclone Energy was 182.2, which is way above normal, 172% of normal. And if you haven't heard of ACE or the accumulated cyclone energy, it's just the metric that we use to gauge how busy the season was based more than just the numbers, looking at how strong the storms were and how long lived they were. The Hurricane Center issued 639 advisories. If that number sounds big, it is. It's extraordinarily big. Our normal is 322. That's from 1990 to 2020. If you average each year, you get 322. So about double of normal. 22 of the 30 storms that occurred had watches or warnings or made landfall. And the Hurricane Center followed a total of 62 systems in our tropical weather outlook. So this is just insane numbers. Now, some more statistics. 25 total landfalls occurred in 2020. The worst of it was in Nicaragua, where we had two category fours make landfall that were only a difference of two weeks apart, and their landfall location was a mere 15 miles apart. A subtropical storm made landfall all the way in Portugal, and we had direct impacts in basically every country across the Atlantic Basin. Specifically for the United States, there were 12 total landfalls. The worst of it was in the state of Louisiana, where there were five, and nine along the entire Gulf Coast. If you take a look at this wind swath chart on the right, the orange here represents tropical storm force winds. Take a look at the United States. Can you see any holes? Along the coastline, there's a little hole here in Florida, a couple of holes, and one way up here in New England. But other than that, just about the entire Gulf Coast and East Coast of the United States was impacted in 2020 by at least one tropical cyclone. Now, hurricane season is formally defined as June 1st, to November 30th. But for the past six years, we've had a tropical storm form prior to the official start of the season. And in 2020, we had two of them form before June 1. Now, at the Hurricane Center, I will tell you when we're in the hot seat, that's the forecast, uh, that's our forecast desk for the Atlantic Basin. The worst case scenario for us is when we get rapid intensification. This is always so hard to predict. Now, rapid intensification is defined as a tropical cyclone intensifying by 30 knots, which is about 35 miles an hour in one day. And 
in 2020, we had nine storms do that. That's ridiculous. That's exceptional. Now, let me just walk you through a couple of these to help you understand. Let's look at some of the Greek alphabet storms because these were truly exceptional. Delta. This was late in the year. This affected Louisiana. But before it affected Louisiana, it was a tropical storm, 55 knots, about 65 miles an hour. That's at one point in time. If you take that and just extrapolate 24 hours later, that storm was a Category 4 hurricane. What about Iota? Late, very late in the year. This was a Category 1 hurricane one day. And then the next day, at the same time, it was a Category 5 hurricane. How do you forecast that? We'll talk about that, but we don't do it with tremendous success, and the models don't either. All right, so let's talk a little climatology, more than just the seasons themselves. And when talking climatology, we have to at least bring up our scale. We still use the scale, the Saffir Simpson Hurricane Wind Scale. It's a very, very simplistic scale that is only based upon the strength of the hurricane's winds, maximum sustained winds where category ones have maximum sustained winds in this range, 74 to 95 miles an hour. And as the category goes up, so do the wind speeds. And by the time you get to a category five, you have maximum sustained winds of at least 157 miles per hour. But you remember what I said at the beginning when I asked you to think of a hurricane and we talked about where the fatalities truly lie? Are they with wind? they were more connected to water, rain and surge. But this scale doesn't tell you anything about rain or surge. So is this really the best scale to represent hurricane impacts? Certainly not. We, we, are, we understand that at the Hurricane Center. So this is an active area of research to try to improve this scale. But one of the assets of this scale is it's very simple. It's really easy for, for people to understand. And when they see a category three, four or five hurricane, they certainly pay attention because they know it's going to be impactful. The problems with this scale lie on the low end, like category ones, which may not be big wind producers, but still could be very tremendous rain or possibly surge producers. So we got to do something about the scale, but we like the fact that it's simple. So before we replace it, we want to make sure we have a scale that's easy for the public to understand. And as I mentioned, this is an active area of research, not only in the government, like the Hurricane Center and NOAA as a whole, but also in the private sector and academia. All right, so let's talk more climo on geography. Where do tropical cyclones generally go? Well, here's all of the data that we know of. So in the Atlantic, it goes back to 1851. And in the Pacific, it goes back to 1949. All right, to so take a look at the Atlantic first for me, and I'm going to change my pen color. Now, each red line corresponds to the track of a tropical cyclone. There are a lot of them. Can you tell? Now, if you're listening today from anywhere along the Gulf Coast, Florida, the East Coast, including New England, certainly you have seen your fair share of tropical cyclones in that area. But this is not just a U.S. problem, and I'm sure you're aware of that. Tropical cyclones go across the Caribbean, Mexico, Bermuda, Atlantic Canada, and even sometimes towards Europe. And the reason why they can be so expansive in the Atlantic is because of the Gulf Stream current that extends near the Bahamas and Florida and then travels north generally toward New England. So that spreads that warm water there so tropical cyclones can sustain some intensity even at pretty high latitudes. Now, the opposite is true in the Pacific. In the Pacific, we have, have a cold water current that streams southward from Alaska, so it keeps pretty cool waters in place near Southern California and the Northern Baja Peninsula basically year-round. So as tropical cyclones try to make their way up there, they quickly weaken due to those cool and very stable conditions. All right, so hold on to this, and let's overlay another factor and only look at the major hurricanes. Remember, Major hurricanes are defined as threes, fours, and fives on that Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale. So just try to take a look at the intersection zone of those yellow lines, which are the major hurricanes. More or less, you can draw a region from the Gulf Coast across South and Central Florida and through the Western Atlantic. So kind of like what I'm circling here, that general area, has seen the most devastating and most damaging hurricanes in history. 
So there's no formal definition of Hurricane Alley. There isn't. But probably if we would define it, it would look something like that. And by the way, if you live in Florida, you probably live in it. All right, so I mentioned the time of year. Hurricane season, thank God, is only half the year, June 1 to November 30th. And not only is it only half the year, but climatology shows a very, very pronounced peak during the season. Whether you look at this red area, which is hurricanes and tropical storms, or the yellow, which is just hurricanes by themselves, you generally get the same answer that the climatological peak occurs right there. See it? Right around September 10th, which by the way, happens to be my wife's birthday. So she wonders why we never really get to celebrate it. But in general, there's three months of the year that we see really the bulk of the activity, August, September, and then into October. That's when we see the majority of the activity. But again, take a look at the data. It shows storms into May, and it shows storms through November because climatologically, we've seen them in most months of the year, despite the fact hurricane season having a formal definition. Now, there is a trend in where these storms occur on a month-to-month -month basis. Now, early in the hurricane season, we're talking about June, and for that matter, May, most of the storms generally occur close to home, generally across the Gulf of Mexico, off the Southeast coast, and sometimes in the Northwest Caribbean. And most of them are tropical storms that time of year. By July, the activity spreads south and east, encompassing the Caribbean and a little more of the Western Atlantic. Now, once you get into August and certainly September, you have reached the climatological peak of the season. And that's the time of year that you hear about these long track, what we call Cabo Verde hurricanes that move across much of the basin. That's also the time of year you could expect to see the strongest hurricanes. But the strong hurricanes continue into the month of October as well. But the distribution of where they form is generally further west across much of the Western Caribbean. And that's the time of year here in Florida, the Gulf Coast, or really anywhere in the East Coast, you gotta look to your South because the big storms tend to form across the Western Caribbean and track northward. That's a terrible track. I, I, I drew it right over my house, so I shouldn't have done that. But you get the idea. By November, the activity shifts back toward the east, and most of them generally head out to sea, except for last year, when we still had landfalling storms by then. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit now and talk specifically about the National Hurricane Center and elements of my specific job. And by the way, I'd love to hear questions, not only about what we do at the Hurricane Center, but any questions that I can help answer on hurricanes, I promise to give it my best shot. So a little bit about the Hurricane Center. Uh, there's a look at the aerial shot of our building. We are co-located with the Miami Weather Forecast Office, and we have been in this same facility since 1995. We are, of course, located in Miami, Florida, on the western side of Miami, about 10 miles west of downtown on the Florida International University campus. The building isn't particularly big. It's about 25,000 square feet. The design team included Herb Saffer, recognize the name? Saffer Simpson Hurricane Wind Scale. Herb Saffer was the engineer on the scale, also the engineer in the planning and development of this facility. And the base of the building is about five feet above the floodplain. You might be wondering why that's being listed. Well, if you know anything about Florida, especially South Florida, it's very low lying, a swamp, five feet may as well be a hill. I've seen that campus flood during the summertime rains, but the building stays high and dry at, at that hill of five feet. Now, if you're curious, before 1995, we were located further east, still in Miami, in Coral Gables, near the University of Miami, or on their campus at, for some time. But of course, a hurricane pushed us inland, and I mentioned it already, that was Hurricane Andrew that made landfall that year. All right, now inside the Hurricane Center, there are three distinct branches to get the job done. The unit that I work for is called the Hurricane Specialist Unit. I'm not gonna mention it here because Everything I'm gonna talk about past this point is related to the Hurricane Specialist Unit. The biggest unit is called the Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch. There are 18 forecasters there that do marine forecasting 24 seven. They are marine and tropical experts for weather and they cover generally large areas of the Atlantic. We're talking the Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean Sea, and a big chunk of the Western and Central Atlantic, as well as the tropical Eastern Pacific. 
And then we have a technology and science branch that has a storm surge unit and has uh, many computer experts that not only keep the computer systems working and supported, but also advancing us into the future. So we couldn't live without our technical and science branch. If without them, we really wouldn't be able to function. All right, so for the specialist unit, what is the main job that we do? Well, operationally, our main, job, our main job is to issue these advisory packages every six hours. And I wanna show you what's included in these packages. We have a five-day track and intensity forecast. You might be familiar with that. If you're familiar with our most famous product, the cone graphic, that's what I'm talking about. We also list uh, the forecast size out to three days, any watches and warnings that are connected to that system, specific hazard information, we're talking about wind, rain, storm surge, tornadoes, waves and rip currents. And we always contain a forecast discussion that includes the background reasoning of what's happening with this event and any bottom line key messages. All right, so let's start the forecast process together. And I wanna give you a few elements of how we forecast. Hopefully you're interested in some of this. So before we can make a forecast, and this is true for every element of meteorology, of forecasting, but we'll do it specifically for hurricanes. You have to do an analysis. So the first question in the analysis, in this case, is where is the storm located? Now, I don't mean looking at this picture and saying, well, it's somewhere across the Southeast Bahamas. I mean pinning down the exact latitude and longitude of the center of circulation. And from that, we can derive its motion. The second question, how strong is the storm, both in terms of the maximum sustained surface wind speed and minimum pressure? And the third question, how big is the storm in terms of the extent of tropical storm and hurricane force winds, as well as the radius of maximum wind? And to answer these three questions, we're gonna use any data sources that we can get our hands on, which include ships, buoys, aircraft data, satellite data, you name it, radar data, whatever we can find to help answer these questions, we will look for. It's almost like fitting a puzzle together. Now, even when we do this analysis, there's uncertainty. I'm not talking about uncertainty in the forecast yet. I'm talking about uncertainty in the current conditions. When it comes to location, we think our average uncertainty is between 25 and 45 nautical miles for the center position for tropical storms. Now the uncertainty kind of goes down and narrows a little bit as the storm gets stronger. And that shouldn't be surprising because you probably know as storms get to be a hurricane strength or certainly a major hurricane strength, they typically have very well pronounced centers or even eyes. And then it's pretty easy to locate. For intensity, we think our intensity analysis is good within about 10%. So if we tell you the system right now has 100 mile an hour maximum winds, it could have 90 or it could have 110. And in terms of the size, we think our tropical storm force winds are good within about 25% of what we say, and hurricane force winds are good within about 40% of what we say. But keep in mind, hurricane force winds are pretty small, so the numbers are a bit skewed to those percentages. All right, another word about size. Now, remember I said in the beginning, visualize a hurricane. This time I want you meteorologists to actually visualize a radar picture of a hurricane. It's not this wall of wind that we often depict the mass. They're really banded weather features. They're kind of these waves of wind and rain until you get to the eye wall and then it's much more compact. But we can't depict that at the Hurricane Center. The science has not evolved yet far enough for us to depict those specific details. So what we're doing here, when we do our size uh, analysis, we're drawing to the farthest reaches in each quadrant to the bands. So if we have a band way out here producing tropical storm force winds, we will draw to that whole area. But not everywhere in that orange area is seeing tropical storm force winds. What's most likely happening is we'll have tropical storm force winds out here near the periphery, and then the winds will die down in this region and then pick back up as you get closer and closer to the center. So our analysis is certainly an oversimplification of how it really works, and because of that, also an overestimate. All right, I got a question for you. Now, I'm not ask, asking you to answer it right now. Just kind of think about it. What is typically the more challenging part of the hurricane forecast? 
Do you think it's more challenging to predict the track or where it's going? Or do you think it's to predict the intensity or how strong it's going to be? All right, I'm gonna give you a second. Hopefully you think the right answer is intensity. In fact, it's really not that close. Intensity is much more challenging. But let me explain how this works. When forecasting the track, today we consider this a more simple problem, or let's call it relatively simple. It's a little more straightforward. An analogy I have for you is this cork and stream. Imagine you're hovering over a stream and you throw a cork in that stream. You can pretty much predict where that cork's going to go, right? It's going to move within the current. Now, you might not get all those wiggles and wobbles just right, but you do know the general theme or path of that quirk. I often tell kids when I teach them that hurricanes are on this racetrack, except they're not driving themselves. They're being pushed around by other weather features. Our job at the Hurricane Center is to figure out how that racetrack is going to change, where it's going to speed up or slow down, and where it's going to turn. Now, when it comes to intensity, it's more complicated. Part of the reason it's more complicated is it's a second order problem. So it depends upon the track. So let's say we get the track wrong. We can get the intensity wrong simply because we thought the storm was gonna be in a different place and in a different environment. Intensity is also more complicated because it depends upon complex factors like what's happening near the core of the storm and what's happening in the environment, both in terms of the atmosphere and the oceanic environments. And it also depends upon internal processes. If you ever heard of eye wall replacement cycles, you'll understand that the predictability of forecasting intensity of tropical cyclones can be challenging because they have these internal dynamics at play that although we understand them to some degree, we certainly can't predict them. And by the way, I didn't ask you this in the poll question, but probably the hardest element to forecast is predicting the size of tropical cyclones. It's not hard because it's hard to visualize. It's hard because we don't, the science hasn't caught up yet enough to predict size accurately. In fact, today, we don't have a lot of models that have skill in predicting the storm size. So the Hurricane Center forecasters still lie on what I often phrase as meteorology 101. For example, do we think the storm is going to strengthen? If we do, guess what happens to the size of tropical cyclones? the outer wind field, mostly tropical storm force wind field, typically gets bigger. We often consider, is persistence appropriate? Or are conditions changing? If we think persistence is appropriate, we'll probably keep the size more or less the same. Is the system expected to move north? Let's say off the east coast of the United States. If that's the case, the wind field typically gets bigger. We consider friction, which will reduce the wind speeds, and we consider motion, which will cause more winds on one side of the circulation and less winds on the other. Every single time we make a forecast, the hurricane specialists go through this checklist, if you will, to try to figure out if our size forecast makes conceptual sense. So we don't just obey by the models. There's a lot of human elements still going into the prediction. All right, so now I wanna talk a little bit about some of the successes and the ongoing challenges in terms of our forecasts. So let's look at the progress we've made in predicting the storm track. And this is a very general plot of our track errors over the decades. So starting in the 1960s, the average hurricane center track forecast error at day three, 72 hours, was more than 400 nautical miles. That is a huge number by today's standards. In the 70s, the errors dropped a little bit. In the 80s, they dropped a little more. But the big improvements took place in the decades following those, starting in the 1990s. The errors got sufficiently low here that we said, hey, we could extend the forecast out. So we moved it from the endpoint being day three to day five. And that happened in the 2000s. And you could see the errors were still dropping then. And in the last decade, 2010 to 2019, the errors were still dropping. So this is a huge success story, one we're proud of quite a lot. Now you might say, well, maybe they'll just keep dropping forever. Well, I don't know. But one thing I do know is they're never gonna end up on this zero line. You can't. I mean, it's just hurricane science is always gonna be inexact. 
I mean, we're trying to predict the, the future. We're never going to do that with absolute certainty. So at some point in time, we're going to see this error trend slowing. There's some indication it's already starting to slow, but we have to acknowledge all of these advancements. Now, if this doesn't impress you, let me repackage the data and show it to you another way. Let's say, for example, that it's 1990 and the Hurricane Center is making a three-day track forecast. And our three-day landfall is right here where I have that yellow square, which is near Biloxi. What was the average three-day track error in 1990 from the Hurricane Center? Well, it was that fairly sizable blue circle you see there, which covers a big chunk of the Gulf Coast and inland and offshore from there. Now today, if we take the exact same forecast scenario and have a three-day forecast position near Biloxi, the average track error looks like that. Huge gains, huge improvements. Any idea why? Well, the number one improvement far and away is technology, right? How much has changed since 1990 technologically? Specifically, the numerical weather models have come so far. So that has to be the primary reason is mostly technology and also the improvement in science and understanding. All right, but even though the forecasts are better today than they have been, there are still errors. There are certainly still errors. And here's what they look like today. This is averaged over the most recent five years. The average day one error from the Hurricane Center is 36 nautical miles in terms of track. And then, not surprisingly, the farther out in time you go, the bigger the error gets. And by the time you get to the five-day forecast point, the average error is around 180 nautical miles. If you want a simple ratio, if you could just remember that the Hurricane Center error goes up about 30 to maybe 40 nautical miles per day, you're more or less getting in the right spot. And we often teach emergency managers to put these error bars around our forecast to help them make decisions. Because as you know, they got some really challenging decisions when it comes to hurricanes, like evacuations. So it's good to buffer in some uncertainty. Now you might be curious and saying, well, how do the models do? And where does your ability today stand relative to the latest technology or these computer models? So I'm going to show you only the 2020 result, and this is for track and only in the Atlantic Basin. So it varies by basin. But in the Atlantic, what we want here is to have a very high line, because the higher that line, the higher or more skill there is in the prediction from either the Hurricane Center or any of the models that I'm showing you here. Now, the Hurricane Center's scale is shown by this black line. So it's way up here. You see it? I'm kind of drawing over it. That is very, oops, sorry about that. That is very skillful up here near the top end of the curve and better than the models that you probably have heard of, better than the GFS or the European or the UK Met. They're all down in here. So better than those, but not necessarily better than some of the other existing models. Have you ever heard of any of these in the dash lines? HICA, TVCA, FSSE? I bet you probably haven't. If you're not in a hurricane science, you probably haven't heard of these. These are consensus models. They're not models even per se. They're averages, averages and blends of different models. Some of them are smart and apply weights and biases, and others are quite simple. And the Hurricane Center's ability, at least statistically, seems to be pretty close to these consensus models. So that's generally where we are. I'm not trying to mute us. I'm just trying to show you what the statistics say. But what about intensity? Where does that stand? Remember, I told you this is harder. By the way, hold on to this for a second. Look at the skill values for track. Let me get my mouse. So we're talking 60, 70 percent for generally a lot of the models, right? Well, hold on to that because I'm going to show you where it is for intensity today. So first, let's talk about our intensity error progress over the decades. So the average error for the 1970s is shown by this blue line in the 80s in green, in the 90s in yellow, and in the 2000s in red. So this is about 40 years worth of data right here. And those are teeny tiny improvements. If you're into math, you would probably run a statistical significance test to see if those improvements are meaningful. And I can tell you, I'm not actually into math, but I ran this, they're not meaningful. So even though there's little fragmented gains over those years, over that course of time, they're essentially meaningless. But what's not meaningless is what's taken place over the last decade, 2010 to 2019. 
this black line where you saw a notable reduction in our intensity errors. So after not having much improvement for 30 to 40 years, over the last 10, we have seen improvements. Now, I remember when I showed this to my supervisor a handful of years ago, and he was a little skeptical of this, and I was like, hey, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, so to speak, we're starting to make some improvements in our intensity prediction. And he said, okay, John, yeah, you show that result, but do you have any idea why? Why after 30 or 40 years are we now starting to make improvements? So I was like, well, I got, I got two theories. And he says, all right, well, let's hear your theories. I said, well, the first theory is there was a new project that was formed around 2008, 2009, called the Hurricane Forecast Improvement Project, called HFIP. And the, the goals of that project are to build new models, techniques, strategies to try to improve this problem, intensity forecasting. So I told them, well, maybe we're seeing some bang for our buck. Maybe that project is finally paying off. I remember his look, he looked generally unimpressed. And then there was a, like an awkward pause. And then he said, well, didn't you say you had a second theory? And I said, yeah, yeah, I do. I said, something else changed at the Hurricane Center around 2010. And he looked at me, he goes, well, what's that? And I said, well, you hired me. There it is. I was a new specialist around then. And he looked at me and he says, well, that ain't the reason. And that's a very true story, one I always like to tell. All right, so where do the intensity models stand today? And, and where do they stand relative to the Hurricane Center skill? The black lines, the Hurricane Center skill, you can see it's way up here near the top, just like it was for track. But in this case, even a little better than the consensus models, those dash lines at some of the time, and certainly better than the individual models. If you're curious, the GFS and the European, we use them all the time across the meteorology forecasting sector. They're no good for intensity of tropical cyclones. You can see their skill level in blue and this light blue shading, we're talking 10 to 20% over climatology, not a lot. The hurricane center skill over climatology is closer to 30 to 40 percent uh, and that's the best we can do we're beating the models but certainly that's still lower than they, than it is for track right where i showed you it was 60 to 70 percent over climatology and persistence okay on to the hazards a little bit briefly the biggest hazard and we talked about this in the beginning is storm surge right this is a definite big problem and I wanna show you how we handle this at the Hurricane Center. This is a relatively new product. I say relatively new, it's probably five to 10 years old, but uh, it's certainly a successful one. What these maps show is a quantitative risk assessment for decision makers. And it shows the height above ground that the water could reach from the storm surge flooding. I say could because what it's depicting is the reasonable worst case scenario. So most of the time, the water won't get to those values, but we provide this data to emergency managers that it greatly helps them call for where to place those evacuations. Now, these maps are only available once there's a hurricane watch or warning in effect. Sometimes we do it for a tropical storm watch or warning. It depends upon the vulnerability of the area, and it takes about an hour to an hour and a half to process this data after the advisory release. Now, one of the more challenging parts of our job is to figure out where to put watches and warnings, especially hurricane watches and warnings, because you can imagine how impactful these, these decisions can be. So here are the formal definitions. A hurricane watch means that hurricane conditions are possible somewhere within the watch area, generally within 48 hours. Hurricane warning means hurricane conditions are expected somewhere within the warning area, generally within 36 hours. See the difference? Now note that these lead times, 48, 36 hours, are tied to the arrival of tropical storm force winds, not hurricane force winds. The reason we do that is we don't want people putting up their storm shutters in tropical storm force winds. So it's tied to when we think the winds are going to be dangerous enough that we want them indoors, which are the tropical storm threshold. Now, when issuing the warnings, it can be challenging because you have to know all of the uncertainties. The uncertainties related to the forecast track, the uncertainties related to the storm size, and anything else that might be at play. And when issuing warnings, especially when the coastline is sort of shaped, concaved like that, 
a small change in heading could make a big difference in terms of who gets what. So it adds to the complexity. And these are just the meteorological sort of uncertainties. But there's other factors that go into place beyond meteorology and considerations. For one, we want to maintain continuity with the previous watch and warning. We don't want to put up a hurricane warning for Miami and then six hours later decide we need to take Miami out of a hurricane warning and then maybe six hours after that decide we need to put Miami back in. That would be a terrible service and terrible continuity. So we have to have expectations about the future changes when putting up these watches and warnings. We often want to consider the vulnerability of the area affected. You can imagine how hard it is, and we do this again with the WFOs, to put up a warning for a major metropolitan area. Imagine putting up a hurricane warning for New York City or New Orleans or Miami. You're affecting a lot of people and perhaps triggering a large evacuation to be done. So you want to take those, of course, very seriously and, care and consider them carefully. And lastly, we want to consider the time of day. We don't want to put up a hurricane watch or a warning, let's say at 11 p.m., because if we do that, what do we want people to do at 11 p.m. or overnight? I mean, that's a terrible message. So if we're more confident that it needs to go up, then you might want to do it earlier in the day or we'll wait to the next morning, because we have to consider how people are going to react when these watches and warnings go in place. Now, one of the cool things about working in the Hurricane Center, this may be my favorite part about working in the Hurricane Center, is the fact that we're not focused on just one region or even one basin. The Hurricane Center is a very international place. And the reason it's so international is that we serve as the regional specialized meteorological center through the World Meteorological Organization. So here's how this works with other countries. Each country across the Atlantic and into the East Pacific is responsible for issuing their own watches and warnings. So think, let's say Jamaica or Bermuda or Canada or Haiti or, well, not Haiti is a bad example, or any of these Eastern Caribbean islands, right? They're gonna issue their own watches and warnings. A lot of them have their own meteorological services, but they don't have their own hurricane center. So they look at us for advice. The Hurricane Center recommends the placement of either a hurricane or tropical storm watch or warning, and then the countries will decide if that's right for them. All of that is still communicated through an old landline phone, although we've had some recent, recent success with some of the countries doing it on platforms like Google Meet, which is how we coordinate internally in the Weather Service. Now, once the forecast is out, our attention switches from meteorology to communication. Now, at the Hurricane Center, we have a designated media room, and this is what it looks like. Of course, this is pre-COVID, so I don't know what it's going to look like moving forward, but we do have a dedicated media room, and it looks just like this. For most of the years, of, of for, at least for me, working in the Hurricane Center, where we have an ongoing hurricane event, this is what that room looks like, and it helps us communicate the message through the media, like you see here. But what's exploded the last handful of years is really through social media. And our current director, Ken Graham, is excellent about doing Facebook Lives and really appealing to all audiences from more conventional media to social media today. Anything we can do to get the message out is important. And I would say our jobs are a really great blend of science, forecasting, and communications. So with that, I would be happy to take any comments or questions. So thank you, everybody. John, that was fascinating. Ooh, I, I can hear you. That's okay. That's okay. Audience, uh, we have about 15 minutes for uh, questions. So please enter them into the questions chat box and I'll read them to John. And meanwhile, while we wait for people to type up their questions, this is a good time to download the slides from today's presentation if you're interested in them. They're located under handouts in the control panel. And one last plug, because this was so fantastic, John, you've got the energy of a hurricane for sure. Um, I encourage you to share this presentation with your colleagues or your friends. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to record, uh, recording this now, and I'm going to upload the recording to the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel later this afternoon. So let me see. It looks like we've got a question. Yes, we do. Um, the first question asks, do you think the public generally prepare enough ahead of hurricanes? What are the challenges and what can improve? 
Yeah, so I mean, do I think the public, it's sort of a broad question, I'll try the first one. Do they prepare enough before a hurricane? It sort of depends upon where you are and what your own life experience is. So I'll say that, you know, being in Florida, uh, hurricanes are definitely taken seriously. But even here, and I showed you that climatology, uh, when we go through droughts of not seeing hurricanes and we have new population coming from less vulnerable locations and moving down here, we deal with the public that's not super well educated. So they don't really understand the significant threat. So I would say we certainly can do better in getting people to prepare. Part of, the, part of what we do at the Hurricane Center is through Hurricane Preparedness Week, just before the season starts, is to try to educate people and knowing what they should do to prepare and there are messages like know, your, know if you're in an evacuation zone, know what supplies you need, know uh, what insurance you should have for your home, and, and, and know what uh, hurricane shutters are best for your home and impact windows and all of this kind of thing. But you know, given that the population moves around, especially the migration to the south, the more hurricane vulnerable locations, I think there's going to be a constant learning curve of getting people to prepare. You know, how could we do better? I believe really strongly in education. So, I mean, I think moments like this uh, with the public uh, and, and just continuous outreach and, and outreach with our media and social media is really the only way to go. I mean, we just want to educate and inform people to make their the best decisions for themselves. So hopefully that answered some of your questions. Excellent. We're getting lots of questions, John. So let me go ahead and read another one. Uh, the second one asks, does the lack of storms impacting the U.S. mainland from 2009 to 2017 have anything to do with the recent improvements in model accuracy? So, I mean, that, that's kind of interesting. So we, we did so we did have a lack of storms from 2009 to 2017. That was a really nice, well, actually, that's not totally true because we had um, Sandy in 2012 and and I'm thinking of Irene in 2011 So there, and, and Isaac in 2012. So there were storms. But one thing we know about sort of hurricane activity is there's just lulls, there's there's peaks and lulls. This is just sort of what happens. It's based on large scale environmental conditions like El Nino and La Nina, and water temperatures and the amount of wind shear. And that just constantly os oscillates. Um, the advancements in numerical weather prediction has been tremendous for making improvements in our predictions. So I think what that's doing is helping us zone in the warning area and preventing this overwarning, and why I think that's such a good thing, and think of it this way, we don't want all these false alarms. Like we don't wanna constantly put a city like New Orleans, a very vulnerable spot in a hurricane warning, time after time, and they get nothing and nothing, and then by the time they're really under the gun, and this is the big one coming their way, they don't evacuate. I think that's what the computer models have helped us with tremendously, is improving that, but I think the change in activity is more related to the natural oscillations in hurricane activity and the environment. Excellent, thank you. Uh, the next question asks, are there any plans to move the official begin date of the hurricane season to May 15? Yeah, there's certainly considerations. Um, so this year we're sort of taking a step in that direction, so to speak. So we are starting our products on May 15th. And when I say products, I mean our tropical weather outlook. We've always had products anytime there's a threat. So even if there was a storm in, in next week, we will start issuing products, but we're going to start our routine products on May 15th. And the reason we're doing that is partly because of that activity we've seen for six straight years, but also because we're already doing it for the East Pacific. So it's certainly simple enough for us to just issue products for the Atlantic since we're already on shift for the East, Eastern Pacific. But there, have, there has been some discussion of moving the start date up to May 15th, but we're not quite we're not doing that for this season just yet. Excellent. The next question asks, as hurricanes continue to increase in speed, strength, and size, is there an idea of a category six? <laughs> you know, that, that came up a lot during 2017, especially for Irma. I remember it was people referring it to it as a category five plus or category five on steroids. I heard all sorts of remarks like that. No, we don't, we don't think that has any utility. Because really, we're more concerned about messaging than what you know what category it is. In fact, we, we're trying to go the other way of de-emphasizing the category. So if it's a category five, it's terrible. It shouldn't matter. I think if we start making more numbers, we're only going to mute the category ones and twos even more. So um, our goal is to sort of either reinvent the scale, and until we reinvent the scale, just hold steady and continue to uh, put emphasis on the hazards. Excellent. 
Uh, next question asks, is there a time of year or location, such as in the Atlantic um, MDR or GOM, or closer to East Coast, when forecast errors are larger? Yeah, that's interesting. So I can tell you there's a region where the errors are typically larger. So the errors are very correlated to latitude. So when you start to head further north, uh, let's say off New England or Atlantic Canada, the errors typically are larger there than they are in the deep tropics. And it, you probably not, if you think about it, it's not surprising. I mean, storms in the deep tropics generally move slower and they generally move in straighter lines. When you're dealing with storms in the mid latitudes, there's faster steering flows, faster jet streams, and there's more recurvature. So it's more related to sort of the natural fluid of the atmosphere than anything specifically about the storms themselves. Excellent. Uh, another question asks, it seems like the GFS with its new FV3 core outperformed the ECMWF in track for 2020. Can you confirm this? I can confirm that's true. Yeah, we were happy to see. So I'll give you a little more background on that. So the uh, we tabulate the statistics every year over the whole Atlantic. And the European had been the best track model for something like 10 of the last 12 years. I mean, it's been just on a tear of being just super successful. Uh, the European did have some changes to it, and the GFS also had some changes to it. And at least when looking at the fairly large sample of 2020 Atlantic tropical cyclones, the GFS was more skillful, uh, better track model than the European at every single forecast time, except for 120 hours where the European was a little better. But if we had to give a winner of a model, I would give it to the GFS. So I'd confirm that. That's a good confirmation. Um, this next question asks, have you ever flown into a hurricane? Once, and I, I wouldn't do it again, frankly. So I, let, me, let me give a little background. I am not a guy that really likes roller coasters or, you know, I don't skydive. This, that's my wife. You know, she's, she's crazy. Uh, but, you know, obviously I'm fascinated with hurricanes and science. And when I was a researcher at the University of Miami, I had an opportunity to fly with the NOAA hurricane hunters. And you might have heard of Jim McFadden, who passed uh, several months ago. And that was, it was great because I had an opportunity to meet him and meet the whole staff there at the NOAA AOC. Uh, and I did get a chance to fly. Um, I remember turning down my first opportunity because of fear, fear of getting sick. And that was for a category one hurricane. It was a night flight and I got too intimidated. And I was so upset at myself that I said the next flight that comes along, regardless of the category, I'm flying. I, I'm just gonna do it. I was just so mad at myself. And it turned out to be a category five hurricane, Rita in 2005. So, I was, the, I was the only one sick on board. And as far as I know, that was the sickest I've ever been in my life. So, so I just am not built to be a hurricane hunter, uh, but I'm so glad there are people that are. So I probably wouldn't do it again, but, but it was awesome. That, that's great, that's a great story. Um, this last question asks, will the start of the 2021 North Atlantic move up to an earlier date? It's kind of similar to what our earlier question. Yeah. That's okay, I'll, re I'll repeat it. So so no, so it's sort of yes and no. I mean, yes, that we will be issuing tropical weather outlooks starting May 15th. So that's our genesis and looking for formation areas, but know that it won't officially be hurricane season at May 15th. All of the official starts will still be on June 1. Excellent. Uh, we still have more time for more questions if people wanna send them my way. Uh, but meanwhile, I, I'd actually like you to uh, address a question that I had earlier. Um, which was um, my my stepson was concerned about what would happen if the, we ran out of Greek letters for storms. What happens then? Well, it would be a nightmare for the Hurricane Center, I'd say that. Uh, but yeah, so if for those that may or may be less aware, so the way it works with the names is we you know run through a list of names. It goes A to W, actually. It doesn't go all the way to Z. Uh, and there are some letters that are missing. But once we exhaust that list, which we've only done twice, in history, that was 2005 and 2020. Then we switched to a Greek, al a Greek alphabet and we got all the way down to IOTA last year. And if we ran past that, then we didn't have a backup plan, frankly. We just assumed we never would have had to go past that. Um, just for your information too, is the Greek alphabet is formally no longer going to be used as through the meeting, uh, the World Meteorological Organization meeting, I think it was last week or the week prior, um, the Greek alphabet's been retired. 
So we will have a supplemental name list. So after we go A to W, if we do, if we have to go on to another list, it will just go to another A to W list that will be available for every season. So that's kind of how that's how it's going to work moving forward. That's great information. Um, well, it looks like we don't have any questions. Um, I I can't say enough how much I have enjoyed your presentation, John. Uh, did you have any last comments you want to share with us before we log off? I think the the only thing I want to share with with everybody is um, you know. I, I appreciate all of you out there. And if, if any of you can spend some time teaching the public about hurricane safety and preparedness, and even if it's some basic knowledge about how to get ready for hurricane season, I think the coolest part of our jobs in NOAA is the ability to just stick to our mission of saving lives and protecting property. So whatever we can do as a full team, let's do it together. Let's just educate the community, especially down south. If you live down south in an area where people continue to migrate, whatever you can do to educate, will help us all. So let's work together. Absolutely, I totally agree. And uh, with that, I just want to thank you so much for your expertise and your fabulous presentation skills, John. Um, audience, thank you for watching this library seminar. NOAA Central Library is extremely proud to present the work of the NOAA community. And I hope you will all join us again. Thank you so much.